Welcome to those who are joining. This is the second session of Tax Foundation University uh, on individual income taxes. We'll get started here in about two minutes. Um, thank you for joining. Welcome everybody to Tax Foundation University, the second session on individual income taxes. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session of Tax Foundation, U Tax Foundation University. My name is Tyler Parks, and I am the Senior Government Affairs Associate here at the Tax Foundation. We are excited to host TFU, a three-week educational program explaining the essentials of the federal individual and corporate income tax codes. Our lessons are designed to explain how the tax code collects revenue and its impacts on the economy. Within each lesson are case studies of common federal tax issues complete with an explanation of the policy and economics at play. Especially relevant now, the in individual income tax touches nearly every US resident and is by far the most significant source of revenue for the federal government, raising about 50% of all revenue. For relief from the pandemic, pand policymakers turned to the structure of the income tax code to send out stimulus payments, enhanced family tax breaks, and various other relief provisions. Today, you'll hear from tax experts, Erica York and Garrett Watson, uh, how we'll break down how it works, the key provisions and how taxpayers respond. We will begin with a walkthrough of an in income tax return or your form 1040, as many of y'all have filled, just filled out, key terms and provisions to know and the basis of income. Next, a discussion on who pays the income tax and average tax rates across the income spectrum. To conclude, Erica and Garrett will discuss tax proposals being considered in Congress and how we would expect taxpayers to react. Just a reminder, we'll answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please send them in via the Q&A function at the bottom of this Zoom window. Please feel free to send them in at any time. As a reminder, all presentations are being recorded and will be publicly available on our website along with the slide decks. Now, I'm going to hand off things to Garrett to get us started. Garrett. Thanks, Tyler, and welcome everyone once again to our second week of Tax Foundation University. And so we'll kick things off, as Tyler just described, uh, to just setting the, the stage here on some key terms, uh, going through uh, tax rates and brackets and some of the con uh, key concepts you'll need to know when thinking about the individual income tax uh, before turning it over to Erica to chat a little bit about tax credits, as well as some of the uh, policy implications related to the, the individual income tax. Uh, and so we're, we're going to kick it off here talking a little bit about key terms. And one of the, the, the foremost things to know, uh, which is review for, for, of course, a lot of you, is the difference between the tax base and the tax rate. And put simply, the tax base is the, uh, the economic activity, be it income, in the case of the income tax, property, consumption, or assets that are subject to, to taxation. So it's the thing that we're taxing. Uh, 
Uh, and that can be contrasted, of course, with the tax rate, which is the rate at which uh, that tax base is being uh, is, is being applied to after defining that base and uh, often narrowing it uh, by exempting, excluding uh, certain activity or deducting uh, certain income from, from that, that base, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, and as a general rule of thumb, of course, as many folks know, if you're familiar with, with some economics, a narrow tax base is usually a less efficient and neutral way of raising revenue uh, for the federal government. Rather, a, a broad base uh, is simpler, helps reduce tax administration, and allows for more revenue to be collected at lower rates, especially in the context of the income tax. And that's really important because as we get into the tax base, you'll notice uh, that while the, the individual income tax federally does cover a wide swath of income, it does not cover all income that is earned by individuals uh, in the US. So on the taxable side, income that is incorporated within the income tax base includes wages, salaries, uh, earned ordinary income, uh, commissions and bonuses, but it, it goes beyond just that. Uh, while that makes up uh, the majority of income in the United States, there's a lot of other income that's also subject to income taxes. That includes uh, business income from pass-through firms. Pass-through firms are firms that are not subject to the corporate income tax, and instead their profits are passed along to individuals uh, where it is taxed uh, within the ordinary income tax, as well as investment income, such as uh, capital gains or dividends. Uh, it's also important to note that we have uh, an ordinary income tax, and we'll go through the rates and brackets here momentarily. And we also have a separate schedule for capital gains, which are, su which are subject to tax upon realization, meaning when the asset that has the gain is sold. And those are subject to special lower rates, uh, which we'll get into here in a moment uh, as to the, the rationale for that. In addition to investment income, uh, retirement income, a portion of social security benefits and unemployment benefits are also subject to federal income tax. So while it's pretty broad, not all economic income is taxed. So there are what are known as exclusions or exemptions from the income tax that don't even make it into when you first are calculating your adjusted gross income for, for tax purposes. The most famous example uh, to point out is the, uh, the exclusion for employer-sponsored health insurance. That is fully excluded from the income tax. And so you don't uh, pay taxes on that, even though it is a, a benefit that you're receiving uh, from your employer. Uh, Tyler, you can move to the next slide. So to dive into the rates and brackets a little more, uh, here on, this, on the screen here, you have a breakdown of the tax rate that's applied to various types of filers and the brackets at which those rates are applied. And it's important important concept uh, to note that, the, that these rates apply on the margin. They are marginal tax rates, meaning the rates apply only to the income above each bracket threshold. So for example, if you fall within the 12% tax bracket as a single filer, say earning 40,000 a year, your entire income is not subject to that 12% rate. Instead, it is the incremental amount of income between that $10,275 and up to 40,000. You're subject to that lower 10% rate on your first $10,275. Important concept, a lot of folks, everyday folks who are not familiar with taxes mix up, which is that in the bracket, uh, the, it's not the entirety of your income subject to that rate, it is the increment amount within that bracket that it is subject to. It is also important to know, as you can see here, we could pass back real quick, that the, that the rates here are graduated. So we have a graduated rate structure in which uh, the rates are escalating as your income escalates. And there is some adjustment for married filers uh, and for heads of household in order to ensure that there isn't uh, as much of a penalty for getting married in the tax code, though it is worth noting that it's not necessarily doubled uh, for joint filers compared to single filers, which creates what is known as a marriage penalty in the tax code. Basically, your tax liability can change depending on, uh, on uh, your, your, the, the details of your tax situation uh, compared to when you were two single individuals. It's an important uh, concept to note, particularly in the, in the individual income tax. You can uh, move on to the next slide. So I wanted to also note uh, a little more detail on how tax liability is calculated. So I'll get into a little bit of the concepts here, and then we'll go through uh, a figure that goes through this in detail. But uh, the first thing we start with is calculating adjusted gross income, or AGI. And that is taking the income that is considered taxable, uh, excluding certain, uh, certain adjustments. So that includes, for example, not including the uh, value of employer-sponsored health insurance on your tax return. There are some other minor adjustments that go into that calculation for AGI, but that's really where we start, is what is your, your AGI. From there, we then move into the world of deductions, uh, which uh, in the context of the Form 1040, you either have the choice of taking the standard deduction, which is valued at a bit over $25,000 this year for joint filers, uh, 
or itemizing specific deductions to reach uh, your taxable income, it's worth noting that you can take one or the other. So it's usually taxpayers will take the, uh, the deduction that is most valuable for them. And it's important to remember that deductions reduce taxable income uh, dollar for dollar, meaning that if you have an AGI, say of $50,000 and a $10,000 uh, deduction, uh, you would have a taxable income of $40,000. It is then that, that you find what your tax liability is by taking that taxable income and applying it against the tax rates and brackets that we just talked about to, to create your, your, to generate your tax liability and determine uh, what it is before applying credits. So you, you use those marginal rates and, and, and brackets uh, along with your taxable income to determine that, that pre-credit tax liability. Uh, and you get there through either taking the standard deduction or itemizing. There are key provisions here that I mentioned, uh, including the standard deduction, which is a, a flat deduction that you can take. It's adjusted based on your filing uh, status. So it's doubled for married filers. Or you can itemize if the value combined of those itemized deductions is worth more than the standard deduction. And I just wanted to highlight briefly three deductions that are pretty sizable and uh, are make up a, a, a strong portion of total itemized deductions. Uh, that includes the mortgage interest deduction, which if you itemize, you can deduct the value of mortgage interest up to a principal on balance of $750,000. You can deduct uh, state and local taxes, either income taxes or sales taxes paid along with property taxes. Though, as many of you are, are aware, that deduction is, is limited to $10,000 uh, under current law through 2025. Uh, and uh, that helps to reduce uh, taxable income for uh, higher earners and folks in higher tax states. And then finally, the charitable giving deduction, which is meant to help uh, encourage uh, philanthropic efforts for, uh, for folks who take this deduction, where you can reduce the amount of your, your charitable giving that qualifies dollar for dollar to determine your taxable income. It's worth noting that uh, individual on the individual side, uh, the, that deductions, uh, to total deductions and expenditures more broadly make up the majority of overall tax expenditures in the tax code. We talked a little bit about that concept of tax expenditures last week. And uh, sometimes a lot of folks focus on corporate tax expenditures, but the majority is actually on the individual side. And these three deductions are uh, make up um, a strong portion of that. I also wanted to briefly mention the 199A pass-through deduction, which is a 20% deduction for certain qualified pass-through business income uh, that reduces the effective tax rate on pass-through business income for folks who are operating uh, sole proprietorships, partnerships, S-corporations. Uh, and it was designed in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, to, uh, to help reduce those, those rates relative to the tax rate that's based on the corporate uh, side of things. Though that deduction is quite complicated, it's subject to a lot of limits, particularly for higher earners to help reduce uh, some of the potential opportunities for tax, uh, tax gaming, uh, though it still remains pretty complicated even for folks operating in good faith there. Uh, and before getting to tax credits, which my colleague Erica will get into, you go to the next slide. This is a really good visual here of how you walking through the 1040 and a lot of the stuff I just mentioned. So starting at that adjusted gross income uh, of $125,000, you have these two choices to either take the standard deduction or to itemize. You can take the standard deduction amount, uh, the $24,800 amount was from a couple of years ago. You can then get to your taxable income once you take either that standard deduction or if your itemized deductions add up to greater than that standard deduction, the total value of your itemized deductions, which in this scenario is 28,000. That gets to your taxable income. That's the amount that you actually take and apply against your tax rates and brackets, as you see in the middle of this visual. And you're, you're calculating that, that amount to reach your tax liability uh, before uh, credits. And so uh, important to think about credits, though, because that's how you actually get to the amount of tax you owe at the end of the day. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Erica, to talk about the world of tax credits to get at your final tax liability. Thanks, Garrett. So a tax credit is a provision that reduces a taxpayer's final tax bill dollar for dollar. So you'll notice that contrasts with provisions like deductions and exemptions, which reduce taxable income. So the value of uh, things like deductions and exemptions really depends on your marginal tax rate, uh, while a, a credit reduces your final tax bill dollar for dollar. So everyone gets that same dollar for dollar reduction regardless of what their marginal tax rate is. Tax credits can be divided into two types, refundable and non-refundable. So a refundable tax credit allows a taxpayer to receive a refund if the credit they're owed is greater than their tax liability. A non-refundable credit only allows a taxpayer to receive a reduction in their tax liability until it reaches zero. 
So let's say someone has uh, $1,000 in tax liability and they qualify for a $2,000 tax credit. If that is fully refundable, they would get to wipe out their $1,000 in tax liability and receive the remaining $1,000 of credit as a refund. If it's non-refundable, then they only get to wipe out their $1,000 in liability and the rest of the credit is just unused because it's non-refundable. The two major tax credits in the individual income tax code are the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. And since the earned income tax credit was established in 1975, refundable tax credits have been significantly expanded. For instance, by 2010, 11 different refundable tax credits existed. And the number really fluctuates year to year because refundable tax credits tend to be increased during downturns. Like we just saw the tax system uh, was used during the COVID pandemic to administer several different forms of relief. And then, Refundable tax credits tend to decrease uh, in expansions when those temporary relief measures expire, though sometimes temporary measures um, do get extended or, or made permanent. In addition to the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, other credits include um, credits for health care and education, as well as things like green energy improvements to, to homes. Currently, the EITC and CTC are the largest refundable credits, and they also are the two largest anti-poverty programs in the United States through two effects, both by encouraging work and by supplementing wages. Um, the two credits are also very costly. In 2022, the earned income tax credit is estimated to cost a little more than $70 billion, and the child tax credit a little more than $115 billion. In a typical year, about 48 million tax returns or tax filers claim the child tax credit. The Congressional Research Service has estimated that in those typical years, about 84% of families with children receive the credit. But due to the expansion um, last year for 2021, that would increase to about 96% of families. So the 2021 credit was expanded in several major ways under the American Rescue Plan. It, the maximum was increased from $2,000 to $3,600 for younger kids and $3,000 for kids up to age 17. That's also an expansion in the maximum age limit, which is typically set at 16. It was also made fully refundable. So that means instead of phasing in with earned income as it has since its um, creation, it was made fully available to lower income households and households without earnings. Typically, you have to have either earnings from um, wages or salaries or business income to receive the child tax credit. And then another major change was that instead of waiting until tax filing time, half of the credit was paid out in advance monthly payments. Those changes, of course, have now all expired. And we've reverted back to the second column you see here on the screen, which is the policy set by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That will be in place through 2025, after which the child tax credit is scheduled to change again when the TCJA changes expire. So what we have is a really um, complicated or uncertain baseline for the child tax credit because it's scheduled to change so much over the next uh, budget window. So starting um, in, in this year, the maximum credit is $2,000 and it phases in with earned income. So it's partially refundable up to $1,500 um, depending on that earned income level. After those changes expire, the credit will revert to a much smaller $1,000 and it will be available to a much smaller share of households because the, the TCJ expanded the income level where the phase out occurs that will fall back down to $75,000 for single filers or $110,000 for joint filers after 2025. The child tax credit, um, one of the problems with it is that it's very complicated for some families when filing their taxes. And it's also very complicated for the IRS to administer. The Government Accountability Office puts it this way, each child to qualify for the credit has to meet certain age, residency, and relationship tests. But given complicated family relationships, determining whether a given child meets the eligibility requirements isn't always clear cut and it's not easily understood by taxpayers either. 
And that's especially true in cases where filers share responsibility for children with a, a former spouse or a relative or another caretaker. So essentially what, what the situation looks like is that the IRS is tasked with administering a law that in many cases doesn't match up with family living situations. And that makes it really difficult for everyone involved. We can flip to the next slide and talk about the earned income tax credit, which is plagued with many similar issues. Um, in, the, in the 2019 filing season, about 25 million workers and families received about $62 billion in earned income tax credit. The average amount of EITC received was about $2,400. This is an, a refundable tax credit that's targeted at low-income working families. The value of the credit is a fixed percentage of a household's earned income until it reaches its maximum. So again, we have a, a phase in for the credit. It stays at its maximum value um, as a household's earned income continues to increase. So it plateaus for a while until the household reaches the phase out threshold at which the credit value starts to um, phase out until it gets to zero. You'll notice on the chart here that the EITC for workers without qualifying children is much, much lower than the credit available to workers with children. For, um, for 2022, the so-called childless EITC is $560, and you'll notice that it dramatically increases when a household has one or more children. Part of the American Rescue Plan in 2021 was a one-year expansion of that to nearly triple the childless EITC, but it's now reverted back down to the smaller size. To qualify for the credit, taxpayers have to meet at least 20 requirements, which tend to be very complicated. They likewise address family relationships and residency arrangements. And that's something that the IRS doesn't have third-party data to verify during tax filing season. The credit also contains some significant marriage penalties. Garrett mentioned earlier that, that the way our tax brackets are structured um, largely avoids marriage penalties until you get to that top bracket. But you'll see here that the phase outs for um, married filers are just about $6,000 larger than the phase outs for single filers. So that means that if a household gets married, they could um, stand to lose quite a bit of their earned income tax credit. That can discourage um, second earners, it can create second earner penalties and a host of other problems um, because it's not neutral towards decisions about getting married. Even though it's a really complex credit, the EITC contains strong work incentives that have been demonstrated to increase employment, especially among low-income mothers, and it's estimated to lift about 5 million children out of poverty each year. But its complicated nature leads to a relatively high rate of payments made in error. The IRS estimates that payments made in error are about 21% to 26% of EITC claims. Much of that is driven by unintentional errors due to complexity, some of it is driven by fraud. Um, most of the overpayments of the credit are related to qualifying child errors. And that complexity and error rate is one reason why many reforms for this credit in particular call for removing that family status differential and focusing the credit solely on work. So we can go to the next slide. So as we all know that the IRS is currently facing scrutiny for its backlogs of returns, um, inaccessible taxpayer service, it's very hard to call the IRS and get help and talk to a person right now, as well as delays in issuing refunds. As of January 28th, the IRS had almost 24 million returns awaiting action compared to a typical backlog of about just 1 million returns at that point. Um, by March 18th, the backlog of paper returns had been reduced to about 15 million. And yesterday, IRS Commissioner Reddig said that the IRS had cut the number of paper returns that still need processing to 2.4 million. So there have been improvements. And um, the commissioner has also said that the IRS should catch up on the backlog of returns by the end of the year. But that's doing very little to alleviate the pain of this year's filing season that ends very, very soon. And in many ways, the current chaos is the, the culmination of a problematic trend, which I, I mentioned earlier, over the past few decades, policymakers have increasingly relied on the tax code to deliver social spending initiatives. 
which adds benefit administration responsibilities to the IRS's normal responsibilities of revenue collection, while at the same time, IRS capacity hasn't expanded enough to match those major new responsibilities. You can see that on the chart here too. Um, outlays at the IRS have, have increased significantly, while the standard administrative spending has not kept pace. So the, the long-term solution for this would be to move social spending out of the tax code and let the IRS focus on its revenue collection mission. Um, but the, the short-term solution in, involves you know, hiring additional workers, answering the phones, making sure the IRS has capacity to, to handle these things that it's currently tasked with. A, a GAO report that came out this week on last year's tax filing season noted that um, in the 2021 season, the IRS suspended and reviewed 35 million returns with errors that were primarily due to the new or modified tax credits that were created as part of COVID relief. That led to refund delays for taxpayers, which requires the IRS to pay interest to taxpayers, increasing costs. And about 60% of those errors were associated with tax law changes due to the recovery rebates, changes to the earned income tax credit, and changes to the child tax credit. The number of errors um, seen there was an increase of about 86% over a normal year. So that just highlights one of the major trade-offs of running social programs through the tax code. In addition to the administrative and revenue costs though, tax credits affect incentives to work. And over the last year, um, you've all probably seen uh, very intense debates about how the changes to the child tax credit in particular would affect incentives to work. In general, when we think about how tax changes can impact labor supply decisions, the two effects are often conflated and clearing up the difference between what's known as an income effect and a substitution effect can help shed light on why so many analyses last year um, showed a, a loss of jobs if the expanded child tax credit were to be continued. So one way a tax policy change can affect labor supply decisions is through what's known as an income effect. And the idea there is that if people have more money overall, they might choose to work less and enjoy more leisure time. But the literature shows that income effects usually are pretty small and might even be zero in some cases. The other way a tax policy change can affect a labor supply decision is through a substitution effect. And the idea here is that if people see decreased compensation for an additional hour of work, for instance, maybe they would reach a higher marginal tax rate through that additional hour of work, and so the return for that additional hour of work is lower than it otherwise would be, they might work less because work is less valuable than leisure. Substitution effects do hold up in the literature, and the research indicates that they're much greater than income effects. And relatedly, the CBO finds evidence that lower income workers have a higher elasticity of labor supply, in other words, a higher response or a higher substitution effect, especially in the component of their labor supply decisions that reflects movement in and out of the workforce. So lower income households tend to be more affected by these incentives in terms of the decision of whether or not to work in the first place. So how does this relate to the child tax credit? Until the changes made last year, the child tax credit included what's referred to as a participation bonus for working because eligibility for the credit depended on having earned income. And the credit phased in with earned income, which reduced marginal tax rates for people along the phase-in range. In other words, an additional um, $1 of work, if you're in the phase-in range, would get matched with 15 cents of child tax credit. So it increased the return to work for people on the phase-in. The new structure that was put in place uh, temporarily last year eliminated the participation bonus and increased marginal tax rates on low-income households. So we would have expect to see a substitution effect at play there as people respond to higher marginal tax rates and the elimination of the participation bonus. But the other big question is, what's the time frame for a response like this? Typically, CBO uses a three-year period, but some research on provisions like this shows that it can take people up to eight years to learn and respond to a change in their marginal tax rate. 
And that's especially the case last year. Um, it was a new policy, a temporary policy, and survey research showed that people weren't even aware in many instances that the policy had been changed. So we wouldn't expect to see a labor reply response, labor supply response to a temporary and really complex change in the child tax credit um, in, in about a six month period last year. So we can go to the next slide. And I think Garrett, you were gonna take these ones. Thanks, Erica. And uh, so, so that gives you a sense of the various sort of components and issues within the individual income tax, including uh, the various deductions and credits that you can uh, use um, and the sort of the mechanics of how to work through the Form 1040. Uh, we did want to spend a, a few minutes at sort of a higher level to talk a little bit uh, about uh, how sort of proposals in the individual income tax relate to sort of policymaker and economists' visions as to what the income tax is. And some of this comes down to differences in how we think about what income is. And that's really important because going back to the tax base discussion, that uh, determines what is in the tax base and what is income, what is ultimately taxed. Uh, and, and you'll notice this is really important because proposals to change the income tax system often reflect the underlying assumptions about what really is income. And uh, often these proposals will move the income tax if they're adopted in one direction or another, and often they're they are mutually exclusive. Uh, though we'll, we'll chat a little bit about how the income tax as it currently exists is a hybrid of these two different approaches to what is income. So I wanna go through briefly these two competing ideas or definitions of income and how they relate, how they're different and, and how they are currently used in our, our income tax system. The first is the original income, income concept proposed and sort of explicated originally by the economists Robert Hagen and Henry Simons, uh, which is really thinking about income as a change in our overall consumption, what we consume on an annual basis, plus the change in our net worth. Uh, and if you think about income, that, that's sort of an intuitive concept, right? If you earn $50,000 in income, uh, if you consume 20,000 of it and you save 30,000 of it, uh, that is uh, the 20,000 of consumption, $30,000 increase in your net worth, that is income, is the idea here. Uh, but it has several implications if you take it seriously that are important to think about. Um, this uh, change in the ability to consume definition includes current labor income, of course. It also includes savings and investment earnings. It would include capital gains as they're accrued because that would represent a change in your net worth uh, if those gains are, are, being, uh, are, are, are increasing over time or over a year. It also assumes, importantly, for the purposes of firms and investment decisions, uh, that we're using economic depreciation. And that means we're trying to match the depreciation deductions allowed in the tax code with the actual or real world depreciation of assets uh, that folks uh, possess. So for example, if you spend a million dollars on an advanced uh, piece of farm equipment and that farm equipment depreciates by say $100,000 a year uh, based on, on fair market value, uh, what you could get in the open market, you would want uh, the, the tax system from an income perspective to, uh, to provide those deductions reflecting that actual economic depreciation, at least, at least uh, in theory. This change in the ability to consume definition can, can be contrasted with, uh, with a, a secondary approach. Uh, you could call it the cash flow approach or the approach that would look at revenue less the cost of earning that revenue. So we're taking the, the amount of revenue that's coming in for a firm or the amount of, of income that is earned less the cost of earning that. And that's an important distinction because it leads to several different conclusions here. This, this concept was originally proposed by the economist Irving Fisher, who uh, contributed this amongst many other core economic concepts in the 20th century. Uh, and and the, the big idea here was how do we think about income in the context of maximizing the size of the economy and overall incomes? Um, and there's several other advantages to this approach that I'll point out. Under this concept, we're thinking about what is the revenue earned? What was the cost of earning that revenue? The difference there is, is your income. So that would still similarly include labor income, uh, and investment earnings, but it would allow for a full and immediate ex expensing or deduction of all the costs associated with earning those that saving and investment. So that includes the purchases of machines, buildings, materials. It may even include the costs associated with worker tuition and training. Uh, and you'll notice that does not require a matching element of uh, within this definition to economic depreciation. It doesn't matter what the sort of year by year depreciation is of, a, of an asset in uh, the context of, of a fair market value when you sell it. Instead, we're allowing for that full immediate expensing of, of this equipment, of this investment when it is made. 
Uh, and that has some simplicity elements to it, of course, because you don't have to worry about this more nebulous concept of economic depreciation. The other uh, major conclusion from this is that it leads to a, a tax that treats the decision to consume today or to defer that consumption and save that, that, that income and consume tomorrow neutrally. Under the change in ability to consume idea, this Hague Simons definition here, uh, there may be some bias toward consuming today over saving for tomorrow based on, on, on how these savings and investments are taxed. Uh, under, this, under this secondary cash flow concept, it's a more neutral tax with respect to the decision as to whether or not I consume or today or, or save for tomorrow. So that's another important uh, concept between these two definitions. If you want to go to the next slide, we'll uh, cover the a little bit of the, the differences between uh, these two concepts within the current income tax system. So there are elements of both. And I think getting more granular here, less abstract will be helpful. Under the income tax, uh, the income elements of it uh, for that first definition, the Hague Simons definition of income, we have, of course, the ordinary taxation of savings. So, so what do we mean by that? We mean you earn income, say you're, you know, you're working, uh, you of course are subject to ordinary income tax on that, uh, on that amount of income. If you were to invest that income and earn, say, some capital gains or dividends uh, in a taxable account, that savings is taxed once again. So you're both taxing the principal amount when you earn it and uh, the returns. That is an income-based understanding of, uh, or a Hague Simons-based understanding of income tax. Because uh, both of those things are change in your consumption plus your change in your net worth. The secondary idea is depreciation or amortization short of full expensing. So we do uh, have elements in our tax code where you do have to depreciate assets or investments over uh, a time period uh, short of an immediate uh, expense. Uh, for example, the modified accelerated cost recovery system used by both pass-through firms and corporations in certain contexts uh, requires this. Structures, of course, uh, well known, has to be have to be depreciated over uh, over uh, 27 and a half or 39 uh, years. And so uh, that requires a, a depreciation over time uh, that, doesn't, that is short of full expensing and is similar to an income-based element in the tax code. By contrast, we have consumption-based elements that are closer to that second definition, that cash flow definition of, of the income tax. That includes accelerated depreciation or expensing that currently exists for short-lived assets, uh, though it is winding down between now uh, and the second half of the 2020s. Uh, it also includes uh, our retirement accounts. When you think about either traditional or Roth uh, style uh, retirement accounts, be they 401ks, be they IRAs, be they other types of retirement plans or pensions, uh, that is closer to, to a consumption style or cash flow style tax where you are either exempting or, or, or allowing for a deduction uh, of that ordinary income uh, and then taxing the returns when they are earned or uh, you are taxing the, the principal amount right away and then you're exempting the returns when they're earned. That is the, the, the Roth style treatment uh, in our uh, our tax system, that is similar to a consumption style approach uh, or cash flow style approach, if you will, uh, to taxation. Other elements include, uh, of course, we exempt interest from uh, municipal bonds uh, for, for holders of those bonds, and the tax treatment of owner occupied housing has some consumption elements to it. A good example of that is we exclude from income capital gains on primary residences uh, with the value of the capital gains earned up to $500,000 for joint filers. Uh, and that is exempting some of that return to, to housing. So there's some consumption element there. Um, so important to, to know that we have a hybrid system here, um, but it is uh, in proposals that, that come out of, um, out of Washington often would move us either closer to an income tax system or a consumption tax system. Uh, and the trade-offs of these two types of approaches need to be highlighted and thought about more fundamentally when you're evaluating those types of proposals. If you move to the next slide. And I think I'll hand over to Eric to chat a little bit about uh, progressivity in the context of our income tax code in our tax system. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. So we saw earlier that uh, the, the marginal tax rates of our individual income tax system increase as income rises, and that's demonstrated here too in the average federal income tax rates that folks pay um, by income level. In 2019, which is the latest um, IRS data available on individual income tax, Taxpayers filed about 150 million tax returns. They reported earning nearly $12 trillion in adjusted gross income, and they paid about $1.6 trillion in individual income taxes. The top 1% of taxpayers paid an average income tax rate of 25.6%, which was more than seven times higher than the 3.5% rate paid by the bottom half of taxpayers. 
And for context in the 2019 data, the cutoff to be in the top 1% here was about $550,000 in AGI, while the cutoff for the bottom half was about $45,000 of AGI. And just a note here, um, the, the average rates shown exclude the refundable portion of tax credits. So the actual rate paid by the bottom half would be even lower than what's shown here if the refundable portion was um, being, being considered. While average tax rates are the best way to measure progressivity, we can also look at the share of taxes paid by various income groups. In 2019, the bottom half of taxpayers earned about 11.5% of total AGI while paying about 3.1% of all federal individual income taxes. And that contrasts with the top 1%, which earned about 20% of total AGI and paid nearly 40% of all federal income taxes, individual income taxes. So of course, the federal tax system consists of more than just the individual income tax. But as this chart here shows, even when we account for other types of taxes, including excise, payroll, and corporate income taxes, the overall federal tax system remains progressive, in large part driven by the highly progressive structure of the individual income tax. In 2021, the Joint Committee on Taxation released data on taxes paid at various levels of income that illustrate the overall progressivity of the federal system. And it's very similar to an annual report that the Congressional Budget Office publishes that it also accounts for most types of federal tax revenue. So JCT found that the bottom half of taxpayers faced an average federal tax rate of 6.3% compared to an average rate of 32.9% for the top 0.01% of income earners. So you can see that the rates rise with income. The income tax is the most progressive aspect. And in, in their analysis, they do include the refundable tax credits. And the bottom half of earners had an effective income tax rate of negative 2%. So that meant that they received, on average, more back in refundable credits than they had to pay in in tax liability. Uh, payroll taxes that support Social Security and Medicare are regressive. And that means that lower income groups face higher average rates. For instance, the bottom 50% faces a 6.8% average payroll tax rate, while the very top group shown here faces a rate that's less than a tenth of a percent. That is largely due to the wage cap on the payroll tax, which uh, stops at wages of uh, $142,800. Now that is designed to match the benefits that are received under Social Security. So that's a, a consideration to take there uh, with the wage cap. Overall though, the progressivity, progressivity of the federal individual income tax more than offsets the regressivity of other portions of the federal tax system. And we also see here that the federal corporate income tax is borne by people across the income spectrum, including the bottom half of taxpayers. So the, the big picture is that our federal tax system is progressive overall, and most of that progressivity is driven by the structure of the individual income tax. We can go to the next slide. So now we're going to shift our focus away from talking about what the tax system looks like now and talk about some of the proposals that are being debated currently to change the individual income tax, as well as what we think um, using our model the, the economic impact of those proposed changes would be. So as we reviewed, um, the American Rescue Plan Act significantly expanded the child tax credit in several ways for one year only. And we also reviewed how the child tax credit is scheduled to change over the budget window. And that means in particular, the cost to make the um, ARPA expansion permanent is very large especially in the latter half of the budget window. We have estimated at Tax Foundation that um, permanence over the 10-year budget window would cost north of $1.5 trillion. And the very high cost of that is one of the primary reasons that the Build Back Better Act included just a one-year extension of the full policy rather than permanence because it would take up so much fiscal space. 
the, the model results that you see here are our estimates for extending the 2021 policy. So that would be both the ARPA expansion as well as the underlying TCJA credit. And modeling these things gets really complicated because of how much the CTC is scheduled to change over the next several years. But we find that it would have a small negative impact on GDP and a small negative impact on full-time equivalent employment, largely due to um, removing that, that phase in and, and increasing the tax burden on um, the, the phase in range. Some of that though is offset by how the, the phase out would um, change relative to where it's set to be at the end of the budget window. So overall, it's a, it's a very expensive policy. And that's one reason why we've just seen um, primarily proposals to temporarily extend it. And, and for a little bit more context um, on, on the cost here, under current law, when, when all of those scheduled changes take place, in 2031, the child tax credit is estimated to cost $43 billion. If the 2021 policy were made permanent, it would cost a little north of $200 billion in 2031. So about five times the cost of current law uh, towards the end of the budget window, which creates a really large challenge to making that on a permanent um, basis. Changing gears a little bit, two of the competing proposals, we can go back to, to the previous slide though, um, to increase the individual income tax burden on higher earners are between creating a surcharge on the income of higher earners and raising the top marginal tax rate that higher earners face. In the context of the entire Build Back Better Act as passed by the House, we've estimated that the surcharge would raise approximately $186 billion over the 10 year window and eliminate um, nearly 30,000 full-time equivalent jobs. The surcharge would apply to all types of income, which would include capital gains and pass-through business income in addition to wage and salary income. Raising the top marginal rate, on the other hand, would not apply to capital gains income, but it would affect a much larger share of wage and business income because it would kick in at a lower threshold. It would also primarily raise revenue between now and when the top rate is scheduled to kick back up to 39.6% starting in 2026. And that's because when the TCJA lowered the top rate to 37%, it did so temporarily. So raising it back up would primarily just raise revenue when it's scheduled to be at 37% but it would, um, under the president's budget proposal, continue to raise some revenue in the next years because it lowers the threshold for where that top rate would kick in. So some folks who wouldn't have otherwise been paying that 39.6% rate would be paying it under uh, President Biden's proposal. Both, both options, um, increase marginal tax rates on work and increase marginal tax rates on businesses through pass-through uh, sector. But the, the difference primarily is where they kick in and also that the surcharge applies to capital gains and, and other types of investment income, in addition to wage and business income. Of course, we've seen um, in the Senate in particular, there's a, a resistance to raising marginal tax rates within the, the tax bracket structure. And that's why the surcharge has been adopted in Congress rather than raising the top rate. But where those go uh, remains to be seen. And I'll turn it over to Garrett to cover some other proposals that, that focus on higher earners and raising their tax burden. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I want to cover a couple of uh, proposals mostly focused on capital gains uh, because, of course, for higher earners, capital gains does make up a large portion of their, their income. And just, just as a reminder, of course, capital gains under current law are taxed when the underlying assets are sold or realized. And so uh, that means if you have an asset that goes up in value in a year or however long you hold it and, and it's on paper going up or down in value, that doesn't lead to any tax consequence until you sell it under, under current law. Uh, the policymakers have some ideas to potentially change that. Um, so the first item I want to, to chat about is just what if we just change the tax rate on capital gains um, and keep everything else under current law the same when it comes to when, when, uh, when these assets are realized and taxed. And so one proposal is to raise capital gains at ordinary rates, say up to 39.6% or 43.4%, including the net investment income tax uh, for higher earners who earn, say, over a million dollars. This is something that President Biden proposed 
Uh, and what we find, of course, is uh, the revenue effects of these types of proposals are really dependent on uh, whether uh, on what the behavior is of folks uh, who are subject to this tax, because people can, in the case of capital gains, choose when to sell their assets. So the, the underlying idea here is if you raise that rate too high, folks would be rather just hold on to their asset rather than sell it and pay a really high tax. And that would actually deprive the federal government of revenue because uh, they're not getting any revenue if, if the, the asset is, is not sold. Uh, and we find that here, if you raised the rate to ordinary rates above a million uh, in, in isolation, would actually end up losing revenue, about 123 and a half billion over 10 years. It would also reduce the size of the economy because it does re reduce the after-tax return to saving. Uh, it would also reduce American incomes by a little bit more. And that's because uh, foreigners would not be subject to this higher tax rate. Instead, uh, they would be uh, more likely to uh, in, in invest in domestic activity and the returns to those activities would go abroad. So that would reduce American incomes by a little more than the size of the economy. And we also find, of course, that it would reduce after-tax incomes. On a conventional basis, it would, uh, it would, uh, it would sort of, um, it, it would, it would end up uh, having an impact on after-tax incomes. Uh, it would change realizations, which, ironically uh, enough, actually leads to mechanically a higher after-tax income. Uh, but that's merely because folks are trying to avoid this tax, right? Uh, they're trying to not um, compared to what they would do otherwise under current law. They're going to hold on to their assets and pay fewer taxes. Uh, so really a, a counterintuitive and not a very effective approach to uh, to raising revenue on its own. If you move to the next slide, uh, that sort of reverses. If you were to uh, pair this raising of rates with taxing capital gains at death, and very briefly under current law, if you have uh, an asset with a gain and you pass it along to someone at death when uh, for that person to inherit it, uh, that person inheriting it does not does not uh, inherit your basis. Instead, the basis is stepped up, and that means that any potential tax liability you had on that asset had you sold it during your life effectively disappears for the person who's inheriting it. Uh, and uh, the president uh, and Congress were considering uh, trying to tax these unrealized gains at death uh, for gains above a million dollars, two million jointly. Uh, we find that if you paired that with this higher tax rate, that actually ends up raising about 213 billion. And the idea here is the reason why a lot of folks would end up just holding onto their assets to begin with if the rate is higher is, is in order to take advantage of this step up in basis to pass along those assets tax free. If you get rid of that option, the, the idea here anyway is that it would encourage folks to pay the tax anyway and it would end up raising revenue. Uh, however, there's a lot of uncertainty about this type of proposal. A lot of issues here. One, of course, is uh, we don't know uh, whether or not this, this theoretical sort of change of behavior would actually happen. It's never been tried in the US before. Secondly, if a lot of taxpayers think this policy is temporary, not durable, in five years it's repealed by a different Congress, different set of policymakers, a lot of folks might hold on to their assets anyway, even if step up is, is uh, repealed in part. Uh, and that means there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty about this, this sort of final revenue result here. And of course, there will also be opportunities for a lot of tax planning that we may not be anticipating as well uh, with this type of proposal. We also find that it would reduce similarly long run GDP by about 0.1%, it would eliminate jobs, it would similarly reduce the after tax return to saving. Um, and capital gains have always been a volatile source of revenue, really, really dependent on the state of the economy, of course. Right now, economy is pretty hot. You may have higher revenue than you will in the, in the future if, uh, if, those, uh, if, that, if that economic condition changes. If you, you go to the next slide, the final proposal I want to mention, a little more uh, recent, is a new minimum tax on high wealth households with wealth over $100 million. This is similarly trying to get at the unrealized capital gains of very high earners who that those gains might be the majority of their income. Uh, so effectively, it's going to throw in those unrealized gains into their income calculation, uh, as I talked about earlier, right, that's moving closer to a pure income tax, but it's not like completely doing it, right? So, so this proposal is a little complicated, but basically they're trying to get everyone up who's captured by this tax to a 20% effective tax rate. So if your effective tax rate inclusive of your unrealized gains is, say, 15%, uh, or in the case of this, of this chart here, 12%, you're basically going to pay tax on unrealized gains between to get you up to a 20% effective tax rate. And effectively, these taxes count as prepayments against capital gains that you may owe in the future, including at death, uh, where you would then square up the taxes that you owe on that asset based on your capital gains liability. Pretty complicated proposal that uh, in a lot of ways would, would move us in the opposite direction of sound policy, especially because it's going to be administratively pretty complex, it reduces US saving, of course. Similarly, its revenue potential, I think, is very uncertain given some of these, uh, these challenges of uh, trying to value illiquid assets and unrealized gains, that's, that's always a challenge. Uh, and there's a lot of um, provisions and proposals to extend out the payments to ensure that taxpayers subject to this tax can actually pay uh, the, the tax owed. 
Um, so a lot of issues here and challenges. Happy to chat a little more about that in the Q and A if folks are interested. Um, but I'll pass it back along to Tyler to, to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Thanks, Garrett and Erica. That was a fantastic overview of a very complicated system we have. Um, so I wanted to start off talking about something or that is on the minds of I'm pretty much everybody is inflation. So we know some parts of the tax code are, in, are indexed for inflation and some aren't. Um, so if Garrett, if you want to ex expand a little bit on that, what is what is indexed, what's not, and how would we expect taxpayers to react to the parts that aren't? Yeah, this is a really salient question given how inflation is now on a year by year basis at eight and a half percent. Currently, uh, several elements of the individual income tax system are indexed. For example, the you know uh, the brackets for ordinary income and for capital gains are indexed and adjusted every year. This introduction is uh, adjusted for inflation. Some of our retirement provisions are adjusted for inflation. So, for example, the max amount you can put in a four hundred one k. Those are the types of adjustments that tend to protect us a little bit from inflation. Though it's worth noting that. Even there, it can be challenging for the IRS and Treasury to keep up with where inflation is going. For example, the brackets adjusted by about three, a little over three percent last year. But uh, of course, that was last fall when inflation was a bit lower. Now we're, we're hitting at eight and a half percent. But it's better than not having any, any adjustment at all. And several provisions remain unadjusted. So, a great example of that is the uh, the exclusion of capital gains for primary residences of five hundred thousand dollars. That's set. Uh, regardless of inflation and with, with real estate appreciation, that is uh, a pretty significant jump, uh, given that it's a well above eight and a half percent. And there are a lot of other provisions, including, of course, the value of capital gains is not indexed for inflation, uh, and which, which, of course, is going to be a, a larger portion of capital gains nowadays than it was in the past. And so what that means is we have a, a tax system that's partly protected from inflation, but depending on your tax situation, that can be it can really eat into how much tax you're paying in real terms. Uh, because it's uh, the value of some of these deductions and in um, credits as well, uh, to the extent that credits are calculated using nominal amounts uh, that are calculated with some fixed limit that's not adjusted to inflation can also be eroded. Thanks, Garrett. That was a that was a very thorough overview. Um, so I think another another thing that's been on the top of minds of pretty much everybody paying your taxes how many now benefits. I think Erica mentioned this. How many benefits are paid through the income tax code? Um, and we've, we found that it hasn't worked out exactly as well as policymakers would have hoped. We've had a lot of issues at the IRS getting these payments out, a lot of delays, 27 million returns are still have, as of January 28th of this year, have still not been finished. So Erica, how should policymakers consider the trade-offs of administering these programs through the tax code? Are there other options that policymakers could perhaps consider to make these programs a little bit more efficient and effective? Yeah, putting it in terms of trade-offs is, is the perfect framing. Um, given all of the, the very immediate need and the crisis during the pandemic, um, doing something like the, the recovery rebates through the tax code was probably the best tool at the time for lawmakers to use to get, get relief out quickly. And that's not unprecedented either. We've seen very similar payments in, in past downturns as well. Um, and I think there, there was a, a report that came out on the most recent round, the, the third round of economic impact payments and had a greater than 90% um, success rate with getting those payments to people. So the IRS has learned and improved on its processes, but that doesn't mean there, there aren't trade-offs or consequences at tax filing time. As we just saw in, in the most recent report from GAO, many of the, the errors and the returns that got flagged and then delayed were due to people making mistakes related to the relief that was administered through the tax code. So there's a trade-off in terms of um, what it, the, the timing for people to actually get the relief to, to jump through the hoops that they need to if there is some sort of reconciliation required on the tax return. And then that also uses up IRS resources and pulls them away from, from other areas where the IRS is needed. For instance, to, to work on the backlog of returns that the IRS is trying to process by the end of the year, they've had to pull some people away from customer service, which has made the, the ability to get through um, and talk to someone at the IRS if you're a taxpayer who needs help deteriorate even further. 
So again, it's an, a, a, a trade-off. Some of the longer term proposals include moving the administration of these particularly complex refundable tax credits that have to deal with where children are living and who children are living with and things the IRS doesn't have the data to um, verify and, and make sure are accurate into something like the Social Security Administration that has more experience with those payments. Of course, there would be costs for SSA in doing that, but it could relieve some of the major pressures we see at IRS and help the IRS focus on its core mission of revenue collection and responding to taxpayers rather than trying to administer these really complicated programs. Awesome. Thank you for that. In the last minute or so, I want to zoom out just a little bit um, to talk about uh, how we how we square progressivity and growth in the tax code. So we know the income tax code is progressive, and we know that economists believe that consumption taxes are better for growth. So is it possible to have a progressive consumption tax to replace or reduce some of these income taxes that we have? Um, I don't know if Garrett or Erica, I know y'all both done great research on this. I don't know if quickly you want to overview some of the research and some of the proposals that have been out there on this. Yeah, very briefly, I, I think that there is a lot of potential to move closer to a consumption tax base while maintaining progressivity in the, in the overall tax code. Uh, of course, we know that consumption taxes more broadly, including uh, state sales taxes, for example, can uh, have larger impacts on lower income earners. But there are some clever design opportunities that can preserve progressivity, including uh, either broader exemptions for lower income folks or rebates in the context of certain consumption taxes, uh, or even applying uh, rates on consumption more directly onto higher earners that, that escalate with consumption similar to how we do it with it with income as defined under the code today. So I, I think there are lots of opportunities to do that. The, the, the great thing about consumption taxes is, is there's a bunch of different ways to design them, uh, depending on how thorough we want to be, what, what, what the tax base looks like. For example, a tax on carbon is a tax on a certain amount of consumption. Uh, or you can do a broad-based one, for example, how uh, European countries and countries in the OECD raise revenue through the value-added tax. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there to help maintain that. And as you say, like consumption taxes, we find, uh, and economists generally find, are more economically efficient forms of raising revenue. And there's an opportunity to do that while also trying to maintain progressivity. And we're hoping to chat a little more about that potentially uh, in our next session. So a good preview about our discussion next week. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So our next TFU session is going to be next Thursday at the same time, noon Eastern time, our tax team is gonna demo the Tax Foundation's proprietary model, explain a little bit of what's going on underneath the hood there. And then we're also gonna discuss 10 key tax reforms for growth and opportunity. And we'll, we will talk a little bit about that consumption tax that Garrett mentioned here. Uh, each, re each registrant of this event will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with the recording and the slides. I wanna thank all of you for joining us this afternoon and we look forward to hosting you next week. Take care.